obvious question, which is, how did your collaboration begin? Two memories of the, the beginning. I know what Gabriel thinks, how it started, so let's start with Pat first and then see if your memory is the same. Well, I probably ought to give some background, actually, yes. because um, I did my PhD on the process called imprinting, which is when young birds will rapidly respond to most moving objects and, and uh, they will then learn their characteristics and then attach themselves to, to that object. And, and, and so that was what I was doing as a PhD. And then I went uh, to, um, to Stanford to work with a slightly um, uh, way out uh, neuropsychologist called Carl Pribram. Uh, and How do you spell his name? P R I B R A M. Uh, he was he was actually as he began as a neurosurgeon, but he then worked with with Carl Lashley, uh, and um, he he then sort of that became his major area of research. And anyway, I, I I wanted to understand the sort of neural basis of of, of behaviour, and, and that was sort of something that I hoped I'd learn there. As it turned out, I mean, what I did was kind of help it in in doing some levers of monkeys. And there were sort of startling changes in behaviour, but it was very difficult to interpret. And, and I, I felt rather dissatisfied with this, and, and, uh, but wanted to sort of do something on the neural basis of, of behaviour. And when I came back, I, res I resumed work on imprinting. And it was my, my memory of, of, of um, uh, meeting Gabriel was we both went into hall uh, uh, and, and we sat next to each other and um, we talked about our interests. And I said, I was interested in, in getting at the neural basis of, of, of imprinting. And Gabriel, well, as, well, as he's already told you, he, he, he was interested in, in, in habituation and, 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 and these sort of learning processes. But we then sort of began to see a real po possibility of, of combining our interests. Um, I providing sort of behavioural expertise and, and Gabriel providing sort of the, the neurobiological expertise. And, um, we both, both uh, as I remember, we both got very excited over that, that dinner. We thought, we thought this would be um, a really very exciting thing to do, to work together. And then, I think, we didn't do very much because you went off and did, you went off to Uganda. I went to Uganda. And so, so we, we didn't really get started um, collaborating until 1968, I think. It was the, 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 the Dinner party. I mean, dinner party. The, the high table um, meeting was in 1966, as I remember it. Yeah. And then you went away. And then, 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 when you came back, uh, we then started to collaborate. 67. I, I reckon it would be about 67. Uh, uh, sort of autumn 67. I, I would have thought so. Yeah, no, it could be. Yeah, that actually that would fit better with the, with the, the, the dates. And, and um, we um, started off rather naively. I think we sort of we we uh, we. Um, looked at a, a particular enzyme in, in slides where, where also birds have been imprinted. And we were terribly excited because we found some changes. Um, and I remember we were all kind of get, uh, offering each other champagne and thinking, <laughs> um, I think you, thinking this is great. Um, and, uh, but then we thought, the, thought that perhaps wasn't quite enough. Um, and and we, we then started to, to um, look around for a, a, a neurochemist who could work with us and, and have proper biochemical measurements, and, and uh, we started collaborating with Leslie Iverson. And um, we did quite a bit with Leslie, as, as I remember it. I mean, we, we, we did several experiments. And um, we, uh, it wasn't very conclusive. And, and, and actually, I think, to be frank, I think that at that stage, our, our, our techniques of training the birds were not very good. And then um, both Gabriel and I gave a talk to a group in, in London um, and it was it was hosted by Stephen Rose and and, and Stephen, uh, who had been working on the effect of, of just exposure to light in rats on, on changes in their brains, was very keen to collaborate. And so we started a collaboration with Stephen Rose um, in I would guess sort of around about 1969, something something like that. And we were looking then just at, at changes in in um, the, the synthesis of protein because it was supposed that learning would involve some establishment of new connections which would involve building, building uh, neural connections with protein and, um, and uh, got some sort of results which, which were quite interesting and, and, uh, and then uh, we moved to, to uh, the precursor protein which is uh, RNA which is, needs to be um, synthesized in order to build the protein and that produced much more interesting clear-cut results 
But at that point, we, we really started to think clearly about the issue. That we we realised that, um, and not many people were thinking about it at that time, but we started to realise that there were so many other things going on when, when um, a young bird starts to, to learn about the characteristics of its this pseudo mother. Um, and, uh, I mean, they run around more, they, they're, they're, they're stimulated more visually, uh, they, they get excited. There are all sorts of things could, which could be producing these changes in the brain. And then we started to think very carefully about uh, what sorts of controls you could do. And I think even at that stage, we realised that no one experiment was going to solve all the problems. I mean, yeah. can, I, can, I, can I interrupt? Because, I, because I, I want to go back a bit to come to the point that you, you yeah. got to. Um, the first one is our perception of the meeting. Uh, my recollection is almost exactly the same. I've been supervising in, in, in college, yeah. and I was late for hall. And I, 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 I rushed in, uh, and there was a queue, and there were you in the queue. And so we stood together, and we walked in together. And that was purely chance. Yes. It was purely yes. chance. Yes, we had uh, arranged it. We had arranged that at all. And I, I don't know that would have, I think it would have taken some time to arrange it, because it would have required us, each of us, trying to find yeah. out what each of us separately did. So that was a wonderful piece of coincidence, mm. you know, um, and arising out of of the, the collegiate structure. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, uh, those early days uh, when we didn't know what to look for, there was a lot of interest in, in this particular enzyme that Pat talks about, which is called anstyle cholinesterase, and it's concerned with the transmission of signal between nerve cells. And there was a technique available for uh, studying it, for seeing this enzyme, as it, uh, as it were, um, staining it with a, with a dye. Um, down the microscope, and we had in, 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 in the Department of Anatomy a new microscope in which you could actually see to put one brain on, on one set on, on one on, on the stage and another brain on, on the stage and look down the microscope. You had these two images That's and you could, right. could yes. compare them. Yeah. See, uh, so we got we did see differences, uh, and we were indeed, as you say, very excited. And you and I discussed <coughs> at Baddingley, I think, uh, whether we should ask Stephen Rose to collaborate. And you're going to another meeting, I think, at the Royal Society, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that is when you pop the question to Stephen. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, that was the only catch-up I wanted to get yes. uh, on it, really. And, and the other thing that was also important was, uh, certainly for me, is that um, uh, Robert Hyde and I had organised this conference on mm -hmm. short-term short changes in uh, um, neural... In, in, in the nervous system yes. of behaviour in 1969 at King's. Yes. King's Finance then. Um, and it was published as a book. And you gave a paper on uh, the, the huge difficulties of interpreting a brain change from the behaviour. <coughs> and you compared all sorts of traditional controls that were yes. being used in, in, in yes. behavioural science at that time. Mm -hmm and showed many of them were totally inadequate. Yes. Um, I think the, the chapter was called, Are They Really the Products of Learning? Ah, that, 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 that was the title. It was a very, chapter. very good chapter. And uh, uh, of course, that was the time when we had to think. Uh, so that focused our minds on, on how do we design mm -hmm. experiments. And we would sit, uh, you and I, it would be you and I, would be sitting up in my room in 86, discussing the strategies mm -hmm. for the design of experiments. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you continue. I, I just felt that is um, an well, This is a good way of actually doing it. That one person sort of lays the outer skeleton and then the other comments yes. uh, and fills in bits. So it's, it's worth going back on to that, 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 that famous conversation at the high table. Um, the, the people who were uh, dish out the Nobel Prizes, the Nobel Committee, would, they had made a film about Nobel Prizes. Um, and they came to interview me at, at, at King's about, you know, the importance of the, co the collegiate atmosphere in, in, in the winning of Nobel Prizes. And I gave an example, this sort of long collaboration with Gobel, uh, which started from a, a, a meeting at, at, at over dinner. And, and, and you know, the, kind of the, the, the sociality of it, the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the alcohol. It all adds together to kind of create a sort of sense of, 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 of um, stimulation and 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 uh, uh, normal sort of interest in the person you're talking to, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it, it was it was a very important kind of context for starting a long period of collaboration. Mm -hmm.
I mentioned to Alan this morning, but we can't, you know, I mentioned that uh, I had this collaboration with John Griffith. Yes. And of course, he was a fellow of King's, and, and uh, it was, um, it, we developed friendship, and I remember him coming into Hall one day, having read a book on the nervous system, he was a theoretical chemist, um, and said, if you can tell me how a neuron works, I'll tell you how the brain works. Uh, and and uh, and we, we 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 sort of jostled over this ridiculous mm. remark. You see. <laughs> I mean, no, because there wasn't a, 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 a singularity of neuron. Uh, and he then became very interested in the nervous system, and we published some papers together. So it's again, this is an illustration of one thinking of how does does collaboration take place? Mm -hmm. I think it, it takes place when you can have an informal circumstances and uh, one develops friendships. That's what mm. I think. I think that's right. However, to continue with the. Anyway, to, yes, to, to, to continue the story, because it, it was a long story, uh, and, and one of the first um, controls that we, we, we uh, used was that the, the, the bird has a, a strange structure to its nervous system, which all the fibres from one eye go to the opposite side of the brain. And, and there is a connection between the two sides of the brain, but it's, it, it, it occurs, as it were, later in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the neural pathway. And so... Um, Gabriel was able to develop a technique for splitting the two halves of the brain without cutting the, 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 the visual uh, in, input. So that you can have one part of the brain which is, is receiving input and the other part is not, if you cover up one eye. So you, the, the technique it was, a, it was a marvelous bit of surgery on, on, on Gabriel's part for, for um, developing a, 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 a split brain animal where you could train one side of the brain and the other side was left untrained. And that actually generated an extraordinary result. I mean, there was a very clear difference in one bit of the brain um, uh, when you compared uh, the trained side with the untrained side. Mm. Um, as I remember, you had, did you have a sort of um, a special little knife that you developed? Yeah, we had a, yes, one had to, you know, develop a knife and get it ground and things yeah. like that. But uh, yes, I had a special instrument on the steering, on the, on the framework that you put. I don't think we need to go into too much detail about that. But yes, one had to develop a particular technique. Yeah. It had, of course, been done on, on other mammals, um, uh, and even in humans, that particular mm -hmm. method had, had been used, but it's a m much easier in a sense than a human, you've got a huge number, millions of fibres going from one side of the brain to the other, and you can very easily cut through them. Um, uh, Actually, you have to be careful, because you, 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 if, you, if you cut too far back, uh, you, you, make, uh, you, you blind the bird, so, you know, so it's, it's, it's got to be done with great precision. Hmm. Um, but anyway, it, it, it worked. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was our first control, and the, the I mean it was lovely, but it, but the, the difficulty still was that the trained side of the brain was more stimulated visually than the untrained side. I mean, so you don't know that it's necessarily related to, to, to something to do with with the storage of of, 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 of a memory. So it's like it's, it could be something entirely non-specific, uh, to just to do with exciting the brain. Um, and so we had to develop other techniques, and one of the techniques we developed was um, just to exploit the, the, the variation you get in chicks. Some, some are much more active than others, some, some um, learn more quickly than others. And um, we then simply relied on, on, on a correlation between the various things that we could measure in behaviour and the changes in the brain. And, um, and, and that came up with... The, the result that again, when it was to do with learning, there was a strong correlation. But how much the how active the chick was, or or, or, or how quickly it started to run, and things of that kind, um, were not correlated. And so you could once again, I mean, you could use this correlational technique for sort of um, saying that there's there's something a bit about this particular bit of the brain which is special. And and so that was a, a the the second technique which we used, which which. Um, Again, came up with a positive result. Actually, uh, at the, at the, you've jumped the gun there because we didn't know which bit of the rain it was. It was a pretty big chunk. Those, those days, um, we quite rightly, given that we had not, indeed, if you give the theoretical background to this, um, uh, the, the, the Carl Lashley, to whom you referred, had proposed that the memories are distributed all the way through, throughout the cerebral cortex, are, yeah. are distributed throughout the brain. Um, and any idea that uh, of the possibility that memories were localised to a particular region uh, was simply not on. Mm -hmm. He had spent his life working on it, and mm -hmm. in the climate in which we began our work, uh, that climate very greatly influenced thinking. Yes. 
and we were in some sense tainted by it but uh, what we did was to divide the brain up into three bits um, uh, so at least is a some crude localization um, and indeed it was always one pretty well, and although the, the size of the chick brain is one centimeter from front to back so you, you, you think it's rather small it c contains many millions of nerve cells so so we were looking at a pretty large chunk um, but nevertheless, it was in that chunk that yes. we, we got these effects of changes in biochemistry that were really very strongly related to learning. But then there was an the next experiment. Then the final, the final experiment we did, um, before we went to sort of much more, um, you know, much more detailed analysis, was I think a, a, an ingenious experiment in which um, we uh, trained one lot of birds for a little bit of time, and another lot of birds for a lot, long period of time, so they were in effect overtrained, and then a day later, we trained both groups for the same amount of time, and that was when we were measuring the uh, synthesis of, of, of RNA in the brain. And the beautiful result there was that the overtrained birds, which had um, already learned as much as they were going to learn, showed much less synthesis than the undertrained birds, which is still still a long way to go. And so that was a, 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 another rather beautiful control for, sh for showing that this is actually related to, to the learning process and not to just being active, because they both were equally active, both groups were equally active. So it was, a, it, it was I think, a, 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 a very, very smart experiment, and I'm, I'm still very proud of that. Yeah, so am I. But it's three together. It was the three together that really, you know, we, 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 you know it was all like translation. I mean, you, you know, one bearing on a mountain doesn't tell you where the mountain is but you need to have more than one bearing. And each experiment was sort of eliminating a different set of subset of possibilities. And putting them all together um, then led to a very robust conclusion that, that what um, the, the bit of the brain that was active, um, was, which was showing structural changes, um, was um, the one that was most likely to be associated with the storage of information. And that then led on to, 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 to much more careful studies to, to localise, and, and perhaps Maybe you should tell that. Well, yeah, um, uh, the, it's worthwhile saying that the experiment took a long time to do. Uh, we, 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 uh, we, I think first published in 1969. Yes. Uh, the last of that series was published in 1975. That's but correct. of course, uh, the 1969 paper was built on, on work that had been done about two thirds from 67. Yes. You know, we were, uh, yeah. uh, refining our methods. So it was quite, quite a long haul. And I remember whenever you because the experiments were done and the samples were sent off coded to uh, uh, Stephen Rose at Imperial College and we never knew uh, what the answer was until the results had come in and then Pat decoded uh, the biochemical results. They were done blind though, was it? They were done blind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I was... Is this necessary? To, to well, well I regard it. Absolutely, absolutely essential. essential. I mean, in fact... And that actually st in part stems off from the days when we work with, with layers, and I don't think we were doing it blind in that way. Right. But afterwards, we realised that we had to, and ever since then, we've always worked blind. Yes. I think it's crucial. Um, this 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 kind of behaviour yeah. is sensitive mm. to all sorts of mm. variation. You must diminish the amount mm. of variation. There's a massive amount of work that done by, by psychologists on, on uh, if you have an expectation about the result, mm. how it can affect how you handle mm. the, the, mm. the data. And, 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 and actually, in, in, in my field, there are many people who still don't do their work blind. They know which uh, way that the, the animals have been treated, or the people have been treated. Mm. And you get these extraordinary sort of halo effects or hoof effects, you know, that mm. re, really influence, influence the results enormously. And, and, and so, yeah, I think it's crucial. And, and, and uh, it can sometimes account for, I mean, the, the, the knowing how the animal has been treated can account for all of the variation. Mm. And, and, and so um, and there's, a, there's a big lesson to learn there, actually. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, whenever you used to phone me up and say, well, these are the results, or we'd go over them together, I was always uncertain. I was very, very uncertain that we, we would replicate the previous results that, were, mm. that, we, 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 that, that, that they were alive. It always came as a surprise to me because it was such, for, at that time, such a remarkable, yeah. well, for me, such a remarkable uh, consistency in the data. Um, well, the next step, of course, was given that we had. Uh, found these rather crude biochemicals. They were very crude biochemical changes, by the way. All it was is to say, well, if, if new proteins are being made, then um, 
the, the as it were the component parts of protein will um, there'll be more component parts needed for these proteins and so we took a component part which is um, um, in the case of ribonucleic acid it wasn't the protein um, the component part was uracil I yeah, and we so. labeled that with a radioactive uh, um, we made a, a radioactive version of uracil yeah. and so if new proteins were being made <coughs> then in that area where they're being made or being made in greater yeah. uh, higher turnover than other regions you'd, you'd see a higher level of incorporation in, of radioactive uracil yeah. into that tissue so it was all pretty crude stuff uh, and, but, but what we needed now if we were going further along the localization is, it, is the membrane localized to a particular brain region would be to what do what's called water radiographic technique, which is to <clears throat> try to find out where that radioactive um, probe is in the brain and do so precisely. And that was a rather massive undertaking. Uh, I had by then, at that stage, in 1976, I'd gone to Bristol, mm -hmm. uh, but we still collaborated. Stephen had gone on his own way with a different kind of things, and there was a, a gap of a year or so, well, yes, two or three years actually, mm -hmm. uh, whilst I was in, in Bristol, and there we imprinted chicks using that te the two-day technique yeah. that you just described. Um, and then we cut, had to cut sections to you know, fix the brain and cut sections through the brain. Uh, and then since I only it was in what we call the roof path, uh, I had to measure, I think, 25, 29 different regions and look at a very uh, measure incorporation in 25, 29 different regions uh, using the microscope to make the measurements. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, slides were randomised, so I did not know which was which. I just had a code, and I put X is this and Y is that, X, Z is this. And, um, and it was a, a rather, I wouldn't let anyone else do it, you see. <laughs> uh, and I was still running the department, of course. Yeah, yeah, I, would, I, would, I, would, I used to go every afternoon, I'd go and, and sit at this awful task of going down the microscope. And go click, click, click. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and indeed, the results came out um, that there was an increase in a very particular region of the brain. Um, which we call IMHV, but which, which has been changed now to a different abbreviation. Um, uh, and I remember um, Stephen, Stephen Rose phoning me up one day. He was going to a conference, and he wasn't part of those experiments, but yeah. he knew they were going on. And he, he said, well, where is this region of the brain? So I said, well, I can't tell you really until we've got the data published, because um, <laughs> occasionally these things are let out and someone goes off and, and, and scoops you, you see. And especially when you submit a, a paper to a journal, it takes 18 months to get it printed. It really used to be very slow. And um, I finally capitulated, and I let Stephen know what the region was. And he then went off and gave a lecture somewhere, and he referred to it. And in the audience, there were uh, one or two people from Japan. Takamatsu was one. And uh, he went off. And he replicated the experiment, uh, and he found the same result. And he published in the same journal in which we were published, we had published, but he published a short note which takes six months, and ours took 18 months. So he got it published in the same year. So in, in, often I read some of the Japanese literature, and it says, and it refers to that result yes. rather than to our result. And to give him credit, he did refer, somehow he got hold of, of, of the, of the uh, reference to us. Yeah. So he did refer to us. Yeah. He did got into the papers, so he, into the journal, so he was able to refer to us. So he didn't, he did in that sense behave badly, but it's, it's, it is an example how one can make a mistake. Mm. And it is difficult when you have a friend saying, well, what is it, where is it, and, and then, and then, and spinning them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, so... There's no such thing as a secret, though. Right? No, there's no such thing, that's why. But it also it highlights the tension between a, a a model of science as collaborative, open, sharing results in pursuit together, mm. and the fact that you have got to safeguard your personal position and your funders and your people you're working That's with. That's a very so. good point. That's a very good it's point. It's a, it's a real tension, mm. and, and, and it's, 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 it's much worse in some subjects than others, mm. actually. 
and um, molecular biology is horrific. You know, to keep that results very much to their, their chest because they, they, you know, the, the drop of the hat, somebody else will do do your your, your experiment for you mm. uh, and publish before you. So they, they're very they're very cautious about. It. In my field, people don't really care very much. I mean, because nobody scoops anybody else. They're, they're all doing different things, and, mm. and, and, and so it, there's much much less of that sort of of the battle to, sort of, mm. to, to have priority. But I, I think certainly neuroscience, and I don't think it's just molecular biology, certainly yeah, what's the, the meat sciences, where there's Any, a lot of competition. Anything that's moving fast is, yeah. is, is prone uh, to this. And, this and of course there's the American thing, that yeah, uh, yeah. Americans that tend not to refer to European literature, but the, that, that's an aside. The tensions are very real that you refer mm. to, because mm. um, indeed Stephen was working on another form of learning in the chick. So he left us with him, he did something else. But he immediately went to see whether his form of learning involved the same region as ours. Yes. And they published a few years after us, I mean, six years after us. But it's very interesting, they tend to refer to IMHV and refer to their paper as the, as the source of it. So you see, that it, is a, it, is, it really is quite interesting. Occasionally I have to say, well, look, the first paper was published in 1979. Mm. Not 1985. But after that, though, to continue with our story, we realised that the neurobiological world would not be very interested in what we were doing unless we were able to show that if we destroyed the area, in other words, intervene, all this was correlational stuff, don't forget, and however good our controls were, and I think they were really excellent, genuinely, I think it's not only you and me that think they're excellent, I think mm. they were good. Um, nonetheless, they were correlational, mm. and they said, okay, uh, if it's correlational, you ought to put a, a lesion there, you know, destroy that mm. bit of tissue, it's only a small piece of tissue, and uh, you should stop the animals from learning, but it did. And the next question was, if you um, put the lesion after they've been trained, when a memory has been formed, if you then put the lesion in, you should abolish the memory, which it did. Um, and so we had, I think, a, a total of some four uh, um, lesion experiments yes. um, in which we had mm -hmm. done, and they all pointed to exactly, exactly the same thing, that the story had become now really quite coherent. Mm -hmm. and really, since it was all done blind still, mm -hmm. uh, the analyses, it was, uh, I think, just remarkable that the, the consistency. But I think uh, many people in the world aren't persuaded yet. Um, and I think I don't know how to one can persuade them, because in the mammalian world there's very little evidence for localization except um, of the pre-tubercle in the case of barricade worms. Yeah, well, as you say, the olfactory work is actually is highly it's localized. Highly localized. Yeah. Um, but uh, localization, the issue of localization, has still escaped um, mammalian studies. And I don't know why that is. It may be well, except the people sort of um, that they claim this is such an important structure. Oh, it's uh, important. It's absolutely necessary, but it isn't but, a story. No, well, quite. And, 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 but, but very often people claim it is story. Oh yes. Uh, uh, right. uh, uh, on the basis of inadequate experiments. Yeah, that, that's that's right. And they, it's uh, what you know we know in the field of reification. Um, you can't solve solve a problem. What you've got is you is a solution to the problem when it is indeed not the solution. Uh, indeed, when. Uh, I was talking to one Brenda Milner, who was the per person who was involved in the first lesion experiment in humans, which triggered everything off. A man had had epilepsy, and they removed this region of the brain called the hippocampus, and he had a very, very severe loss of memory for events in his past. Uh, no, sorry, not for no, events no. in his past. He couldn't acquire new memories. That that's was that's he could that's not that's acquire new memories. Um, this triggered off a huge amount of work, still going on in, in the yeah. anim, an, animal world as well as in the human world. When I ask Brenda, uh, what does, does she think the hippocampus is doing, she has said to me, well, I haven't a clue. <laughs> Notwithstanding all the work that's being done, I have no idea. And it remains, I think, a mystery. Malcolm Brown has shown uh, that from electrophysiology, electrophysiology that what was claimed that it would do in memory, Yes. It does not do. It's some other region that was hooked up in the lesion. Yes. When when uh, when Brenda Miller's surgeon did the operation on this human being, they necessarily couldn't restrict the uh, the, uh, the lesion to suck out that particular bit of brain, and restricted that bit of brain. They sucked out quite a lot more, and it turns out 
it was the other bit that they mm -hmm. sucked up that was the, doing the damage rather than the hippocampus itself. So we are back a long way on the hippocampus. No, I, I think uh, the issue of very far from being solved in the mammalian and human brains. Uh, and the only way to persuade anyone that we do have localization is to encourage them to read the whole build-up. Yes. It's not only the, as it were, the, the biochemical work, which was, in a sense, a self-contained unit. Yes. The predictions that are made from it, about lesions, for mm. example, uh, to a restricted area, but not other areas, uh, are also consistent. Um, and since then, um, as you gradually withdrew a little from it, we began to think of theoretical aspects yes. of it as well. Uh, we went on to look at other molecular biological aspects of what is going on in, in this brain region and um, electrophysiological studies recording from single nerve cells in there. But that is not anything I would want particularly discuss because that isn't that was part of our, that was uh, our collaboration. Yeah. But we did go on to think out um, how you might model the functions of this brain region. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you again. Actually, just going back one step, um, because nowadays we have all sorts of imaging techniques that, that which are available to, to uh, uh, see where bits of the, of the brain are active, like the PET scans and the, the uh, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, scans, and, uh, and, and they're beautiful, they, they, they generate these wonderful pictures. But one doesn't know whether the site of activity is upstream or downstream or to, or, or to the side of, 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 the, of the effect you're particularly interested in. And people forget that. I mean, they, they, they don't do all the necessary controls. And, 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 and as a result, there's a vast amount of literature which you simply can't interpret properly. I mean, maybe it's, well, this area becomes, it lights up, but what does that mean? So, I mean, there's, a, there's an enormous literature which does, based on these beautiful pictures, which is actually over-interpreted, vastly over-interpreted. Anyway, to go back to the, sort of the, 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 the more theoretical things, um, at the very early stage, actually, in, in, in our collaboration, we've been talking about how you might start to model this, uh, this, this these effects that we discovered. And, uh, uh, and then we didn't do very much with it. Um, we, well, we did, we talked about it a lot, but we didn't publish anything. Just let me get this one in. <laughs> because we, when, when I was in, in Bristol, uh, you used to come across about once a month, yes. and I used to come to Cambridge about once a month. Yes. So we met at least once a month, and we talked about the design of experiments. We did that experiment of stimulating the brain, if you remember. Right. Uh, yes, uh, that's one thing we, we mentioned. That was an interesting one. But yeah. um, um, we talked about theoretical work, yeah. and you had a room in a... a um, yes, a staircase. A five, a staircase, and yeah. we used to work long hours on this model. Yes. And um, we, we, I said, I think this isn't really very interesting. It was entirely my fault. It was, I, 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 except for, I said, there's nothing new in this. And we used to draw diagrams of how neurons would be interacting with each other. Yes. And, and I said, there's, there's nothing new in this. Uh, so we didn't really move on. And then, Sometime, several years later, I think I'd come back from Bristol, I think, to Cambridge. I was at a meeting in Oxford yes. on, on um, networks. Mm -hmm. And I saw the main speakers from, uh, I can't remember his name now, from the state, show a model that I could have sworn had been rifled from our files. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I was so taken back by this, I mean, really quite shocked. Yes. It was as if someone had come into the house and robbed me of some of, of, of my property. Um, our property is this yes. case. But you know, I mean, yes. I, I, I had copies, yes. either the original copies yes. of drawings or copies of... Uh, yes. We copied the uh, bits of paper that we had at those meetings. <clears throat> and I came back to Pat, groveling. I said, I've done you a great disservice, Pat, mm -hmm. because... Had we published that paper at the time we were writing it, we would have absolutely scooped the field. Yeah. It was absolutely new. But for me, I didn't see any new principles of neurobiology. What I failed to grasp was there were, in fact, new ideas for artificial intelligence. And that was my failure, and that was why we were completely scooped. Completely scooped. 
But anyway, we did, we, we did, we did, and I, I spent an awful lot of time um, uh, developing computer programs to, 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 to simulate this, which were, were, were realistic both at the behavioral level and at the neural level. I mean, they, they, they incorporated principles which, which were, were well understood at, at both levels. And, and, and then these programs actually were, were, were very remarkable because they, they were simulating exactly what we've been finding and simulating a lot of the biology and also throwing up things which um, we hadn't really expected. I mean, there's a, a remarkable process which um, we uh, are all familiar with in a sense, which was known as um, developing polymorphous concepts, that's to say um, there may be a variety of things by which you recognize something, but not all of those things will be present all of the time. What we, we call polythetic classification. Yeah, well, well, the same yeah. thing. It was, that, a, it was that, a mathematician that, in Johns who was very interested in this. I didn't know that. Mm. But anyway, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a well-known phenomenon, mm. and, 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 and it's very difficult for humans, actually. I mean, if, 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 you, if you have a, um, only a subset of the things, though, you, you, you have great difficulty sometimes mm. in, in actually saying, is it this category or is it this category? Mm. Anyway, um, the, the, our neural net model um, would uh, also have difficulty with it, unless they had been exposed, it had been exposed to pure sets uh, where, which had all the, the components of one category, all the components of the other category, and, and, and you, you, you train it for quite a long, long time, and then you start to take away some of the characteristics, and then it does very well. It, 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 it generalizes very well. So it's, it's, it's a function of the experience of, of the thing. And, it, and what was regarded as an extremely difficult cognitive problem actually turns out to be very simple. It's based on, on simple principles of generalization. And so, in a way, I don't think we either expected that that, yeah. fe that feature of the model to come out, but it did. Mm. Um, and the other thing which I thought was actually very exciting, in a way, was, was that we, we know that very detailed little things about um, the mother are important in recognising the mother uh, and distinguishing her from another mother, little details of plumage. And um, what we found with the model was that um, even though things which are weren't very exciting to the to, to the to the model to begin with. Um, if they were associated with other things which were exciting, which had high value, by degrees these things which had low value became more and more important. So that by the time the, the, the model was well trained, it would do what an expert bird watcher will do, which is you know, a bird flashes across and you say that, that's a that's a kestrel, or you know you know, you, you can do these these, these very quick um, uh, judgments. On the basis of very limited information, and that's what the model will do too. So that was another actually a nice thing that came out of it. That you, you could train it to actually recognise very fine features of, the, of, 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 of something which it, it, an animal has to do. I mean, it has to make these fast discriminations on the basis of rather limited information. When you say it, do you mean a computer model? Yes. Yeah. But that was based on on uh, on, on on what we knew of our chicks. So it, it it had a very very strong neural basis. Um, uh, as well as the behavioural, so yes, we had to account for the neural work, and, and we had to account for the uh, for the behavioural aspect. So, so uh, I mean, it, it, it did it did have a lot of kind of interesting consequences, um, which uh, and we published it. I mean, eventually, I mean, long after we might have not published it, it 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 came out. Um, and I think it was actually it was a good paper, but it was not it didn't scoop the field by any means. Yeah, it was, sort of, no, it it was, was late. It was late, and, and yeah. the lateness was entirely my fault. It's extraordinary, really. Mm. Were and you really. working with any of the computing scientists who were around at that time? For example, in this is the early seventies, presumably we're talking about. Now. No, no, this was no, this, no. This, 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 this late eighties, early nineties. Oh, oh. uh, yeah, so, so, so. yeah. And there were lots of people working on neural nets. But we had begun at the point we had begun when I went to, to Bristol in nineteen seventy four. We had begun to work on it. Yeah, no, we, no, we were on to this. <laughs> no, I had a sketch of that, us, uh, the, the model which we finally used, actually, yes. used the, uh, yeah. uh, you know, ten years before. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mine was all dusty, you know, yeah. and yellowing yeah. when I went back and lost this man and showing this slide. <laughs> 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 yes. And I, I guess that was our, our really our, our last bit of, of, of a collaboration. I mean, it was sort of. A, a, yeah, I think it was. Um, I think it was. But, it was really, but, um, but that was 30 years after we started, almost 30 years after we started. Um, Can I ask one or two questions about the collaboration? Um, to start with, you mentioned when you were at Bristol, you'd meet sort of once a month or twice a month. 
when you were in Cambridge, how much time were you actually spending in each other's company? Because many models of scientific collaboration suggest that people actually had to spend hours and hours and hours talking together, you know, spending long evenings. Well, in the early days, <coughs> in the early days, we spent, Pat and I, I mean, spent hours and hours and hours walking and talking, or in our rooms. I remember particularly 1885, yes, yes. I remember those particularly. Where did you uh, walk? I, know, it, we, I remember one lovely walk uh, behind the brook, um, behind, beside the young... Yes, the so we were out ahead in the allotment there. Yes, and, and that was, that was one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. one occasion when uh, we thought up a, a, an experiment in which uh, the question is, could you implant a memory in a brain? I always thought it was impossible to do it in front of memory in the brain. But we knew that chicks were able to discriminate lights flashing at different frequency. Like, mm. and lights flashing rather less frequently. Um, and so we did do an experiment, and it involved implanting electrodes into what we now knew to be IMHP, IMM as it's now known, um, and giving pulses. Of a, in, in, to a chick, may have been, the chick may have been in the lighter or the dark, I can't remember, but anyway, a chick, you've got pulses, it doesn't hurt the animal at all, I mean, um, you give these pulses at the frequency of a flashing light. One group of chicks has a frequency of 4.5 a second, the other at 1.5 a second, and you match it for the numbers yes. of pulses and so on. So. And then after you finish that, you give the chick a choice between a light, a real light in the outside world, which is flashing at 4.5 a second, and a light which is flashing at 1.5 a second. And the, the, the chicks with the 4.5 a second stimulation went for the 4.5 a second real light. And the chicks going for the 1.5, the tra train with electric mm. pulse of 1.5, went for the light at 1.5. Now, uh, and, it was, and it didn't happen with another, when we put the electrodes in another bit of the brain, which it should have done if it had been a trivial observation. That also did not elicit much uh, interest, except no, I, that it didn't, it, I don't know whether you know this, I don't know if I told you this, uh, one, one day, I, uh, um, many years afterwards, I had come home from the department's office mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to uh, load our home, and uh, my wife, Pearl, uh, as I opened the door, she, she came to me and put her arms around me and said, I, uh, it's wonderful being married to a famous person. <laughs> uh, I, 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 obviously ironic. <laughs> what had happened was there was a, a book was written. Uh, it was a thriller, um, and the, the the centrality of it all was that someone had had a memory implanted in their brain by electrical stimulation, and the key was, if you want to know the answer says the detective, you'd better go and read that paper by Horn Ever and other <laughs> Cambridge scientists. And and brilliant reading. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, that is how I came to think on that experiment. Uh, but no was we walked there, I, I mean we no didn't have a never uh, as well as I or have a No I don't think and I d I, 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 I don't think so, no, I haven't heard of it, but there's no, I don't, I, I make it a stand up, I put it certainly would stand up. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of interesting, because, it, because it, 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 in the way it's such, it was such an implausible experiment, mm -hmm. and yet it, 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 it did work. But it's yeah. implausible, except people have been saying, if you want to demonstrate a brain region involved in memory, you ought to be able to implant a memory in that region. That's right. And that's precisely what we did. Yeah. And, and, and that was the result of a long walk. That was, that was, that, that was the walk. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, implausible yeah. theories come up on long walks. Is that, uh, I wouldn't say that. that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but where else did we walk, Pat? Um, yeah, I remember we used to walk along um, Devil's Dyke. Um, yes. That, that was a lot we, uh, These were really long walks, not just a long run. No, no, no. no. Some, of them, some of them were really long walks. I mean, mm. some hours. Mm. And, you know, intense discussion. I mean, and in Bristol, we walked around, around, the, uh, around Clifton and uh, yes. the bridge and into uh, the Lee Woods. And, uh, yeah. uh, yes, and always we were standing, walking with this tall figure. I had not shown the lovely <laughs> Pat. Pat looking utterly disreputable in an awful overcoat. I remember uh, you used to come in this dreadful overcoat and, and the collar was up and, and you looked real shabby. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, and I, it was my, my trap coat. <laughs> <laughs> your trap coat. <laughs> and I used to, 
<laughs> Look at you. God, what is this man walking with? <laughs> but we used to tramp around Bristol. That was the point that we would walk around with these posh marts of Bristol. Me with this tramp. <laughs> but otherwise it would be intense discussions with bits of paper. Um, in, you, you mentioned the alcohol. I mean, does... When you were sat, sitting up late at night, would you? Be no, no, I, I don't. We never. I don't remember that we would. It would be. We would be. I, I don't remember that we would um, drink when we were actually talking about the design of experiments. Or no, I don't remember anything like that. I do remember after we'd done an experiment at Mattingly, we used to go up to a pub at Dry Drayton and um, would have a um, ploughman's lunch and half pint of beer. That mm. was about the only. Mm drinking that was done. Uh, no, the drinking <coughs> was really uh, uh, meeting each other first of all at King's, uh, and that drinking, I mean, it wasn't correct, I mean, a couple of glasses of wine, you know, but mm. it, I think, so, so, I didn't know him, and he was younger than I was, and I think he'd just become a, a, a research fellow. Yeah. And uh, the beauty of this system that we have here is that it's non hierarchical and, mm. and, and, and in sitting next to someone, they have a glass of wine, and they ask you what you do, and you tell them a bit about mm. what you do, and then it begins to flow more mm. easily, but mm. it's because it is a non-hierarchical system, and I think it's just made for um, intellectual interactions. Mm. I've had more than one, but perhaps is the longest and most mm. the certain most sustained. Another, another question. We talked on the contradiction between openness and personal um, publications and so on. What about, in, in my field of um, the social sciences, it's very difficult to work with colleagues because we have a, a model of a single author. So you write a book, and you know, to collaborate on a book is difficult, and to collaborate on articles. Were there any times, and this is a rather frank question, were there times when there was a competition between you for status? In other words, um, you felt that it was difficult to co-publish an article together or that one of you had done more work than the other on it and therefore there should be some I think we had that well, well worked out actually. We did alternate all, we first, alternated, first, first, we first authorship. Uh, we did, we yeah. alternated and, and where it was clear that one had done more than the other. Yeah. Uh, if you take for example the brain lesion stuff, yeah. Uh, that my name would be come first. Come yeah, first. Yeah, my yeah, name came yeah. first. When you look at the autoradiography, my name came first. Yeah. If you look at many of the behavioural papers, your name came first. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so the order of names indicates something about... Not always. Not always. I mean, in our case, it did. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it, yeah, and we did discuss it. I mean, it, 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 you're right. It, 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 it is a potential source of conflict, mm. and it's particularly difficult when you have some more junior people involved. Mm. And, 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 mm. uh, certainly... Um, I, I had a practice of, of allowing my graduate students always to publish on their own mm. because, because I, I felt it, if my name was there, it would actually interfere with, with, with their subsequent careers. And so, mm. um, I mean, not all people feel that, but I, mean, I, I, I certainly felt that. Well, I, I didn't do that because when I had research students, I spent so much time on the teaching them the techniques, yes. designing the experiments for that. I, I really don't think they could easily have designed the experiment, especially when I was working on electrophysiology, um, what, exactly what should be done, and they required a tremendous amount of help all the time. And it was really a part of my own research activities. I could have been doing other work if I had not been yes. occupied in looking after them. So I didn't feel, but I always put my research students with the, the name, name first. Yes. I, I didn't have all that many research students, I just didn't have enough time for it, but I had, one, I had a few. Um, but certainly with my junior colleagues now, uh, postdocs for example, yes. um, where I would have designed the experiments and, and taught them what to do um, yeah. and, and analyse the results. Uh, I mean, there had been a change in culture, I mean, because of the research assessment exercise, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. you have to do it, in fact, you, 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 you have to kind of claim credit for your department. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 that's a change of, of because, because which is imposed on us really. I mean, we, we yes, I think in the behavioural sciences um, uh, th there was very much more the tradition of letting the person write their own. You know, and, and, and they would be much more of, of their own individual kind of effort. It would be. Yeah. Through it. I mean, so, so they'd be much more working on their own. I mean, although I, I, mean, I, I would spend time with my students, so I, would, I don't think I probably spent as much time as you did sort of training them. Um, a lot of that they had to discover for themselves. Mm. Would you, um, again, in, in the arts and social sciences, it's possible to get a long way, uh, a certain distance anyway, on your own. But um, would it be true to say that 
without your cooperation, many of the things that you are trying to do would have been impossible. Well, I'm saying unequivocal. Unequivocally, I would say that we, the, the things that I have done in printing could not, could not have been done without that collaboration with Pat. Now, you'd say, was Pat unique in this knowledge? If I'd got someone else that had the skills uh, in imprinting, the behavioural scientific skills, yes, in principle, I could have done. It so happens uh, that Pat was all very nearly unique in, in the world at the time, mm. in fact, so it was my good fortune. But the other thing was that we clicked. We liked each other. We liked each other. <laughs> and I, I might not have, uh, um, if there had been another Pat intellectually, if you see what I mean, yeah. um, uh, in, in knowledge of imprinting, I might not have gone on well with them, and it made us have collapsed. So yeah. the fact that we uh, got on well together, our families got on well together, and we are very close friends still, yeah. and, and family friends, of course. Uh, um, and, um, and had the community of the college to keep us together in our professional lives. So mm. we, we kept together in the laboratory, mm. Even though initially we were in different laboratories, and, and, and after that period I was in anatomy, that was in zoology, then I went to anatomy at Bristol, so we had to contrive our meetings. Mm -hmm. um, then when I came to zoology, we were then in the same department, um, but there was an additional dimension, mm -hmm. that is, there was the college where we would meet, we were having, having a common interest within the college, mm -hmm. which was the college, um, and, a th and a third interest which was the overwhelming one, really, was, was the joint work. But I think it was this amalgam that yeah. made it work, and I don't think, it, without that amalgam, I don't think it could have been sustained. Mm. I mean, it was interesting that, um, <coughs> that well, and it was because we spent so much time together, that we realised that quite often um, we were punning, you know, we were using words in slightly different ways, and, 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 and so we would sort of sometimes pass each other by in, 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 our, in this, our discussions. And it was, it, it, and I think it's, it happens again and again actually when people from very different sort of um, backgrounds sort of start to work together. They're, 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 they're using the same words in different ways, mm. and, 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 and it takes time to discover that. And, you, and, and, and you, you, you need to work together for a long time before, before you realize that actually you're, you're, you're using language rather differently from each other. Mm. Um, so there was that too, which I, I, mean, I find very interesting, and, 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 I, and I see it sometimes now with the people who, who, who are trying to collaborate and, and, and falling out because they don't understand each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you build up a sort of secret shorthand? language, or not secret, but a shorthand, so you could just refer very quickly. Uh, when I've worked, collaborated with scientists, yeah. you know, you've got a history and therefore you can just say something which is a mnemonic for a whole world and experiment. I'm sure we did. I mean, I, I'm not really conscious of it, but I'm sure... No, we did. Well, the acronym that we have for the bit of brain, yeah, yes. that was a, a code, I yeah. suppose, but the code is well known throughout the world. I mean, people who work yes. in this field know about this region of the brain. So... Uh, not consciously, but I mean, I, I, I'm sure that if if I've been describing, mm. and probably already, some of the things mm. I, that we've described to you mm. may have may have been opaque. I mean, it, and, and, and that was because you know we knew what we're talking about, mm. but you wouldn't. Uh, so, so uh, yes, I, 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 th I think there is inevitably an mm. element of, of, of acquiring a kind of language. Mm. I had a very um, <laughs> the first time I, I gave um, uh, lectures as a, as a university lecturer, um, and I thought it was important that the students acquire some of the jargon of the subject. And so uh, the, 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 the lectures were studded with, with, with jargon terms. And we have a sort of questionnaire at the end of our, 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 our lectures, <coughs> and, and, and the students complained about the jargon. So I thought, okay, well, that's all right. Ne next year, I'll, 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 I'll put it into plain English. And then when I started to try and turn my lectures into plain English, I realised that I didn't, even I didn't understand quite the sort of terms. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody in the community was using it. Um, and, and so I thought I knew what it meant, but then I didn't. <laughs> it was quite solitary. <laughs> I've, got, I've got one more question, and then this tape is going to be finished. Um, that is, um, Einstein once said something along the lines of, unless an idea starts out as absurd, there is no chance for it. In other words, it, it's got to be away from conventional associations, relations, 
and so on. Now, I've, from my own experience, I always start out with absurd ideas because they're large ideas and most of them are wrong. And then when I put them to the person with whom I discuss everything and who is my intellectual partner, that is Sarah, my wife, mm -hmm. she nearly always at the beginning says, this is absurd, this is ridiculous, you, know, you can't. And I find that the, the pressure of trying to convince her and persuade her, and we get into quite fierce arguments usually on the first drafts of my books, because she says, this is ridiculous, you, know, you can't <laughs> say that, there's no... And then I gradually, as I unfold the ideas, I convince her, and at the end she says, yes, I see now. Um, was this your experience at all with each other? In other words, one of you would say something, and you get into fierce arguments and say, that can't be right, and so on. Or did you tend to, quite early on, fuse your ideas? We did have long discussions about some things. I mean, very often, actually, it was... Um, discussions with Stephen Rose, I and mean, when we did that long review for science, and and, um, and Stephen didn't properly take the point about the difficulty of, of, of sorting out these sort of things which, which were always confounded. Uh, and I, I remember there was, we had quite a lot of discussion at, at that time. And it was largely kind of a, more sort of philosophical discussion almost, you know, what, how could you be sure that what you were dealing with was, was both necessary for and exclusively related to, to um, the storage of information. Mm. And, and um, there was, I, 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 I can remember we sort of had long periods of discussion up in your... your, your, your yeah, room. but that was, a lot of that was you and me, but... Uh, was, but but uh, when Stephen came in, because he was a co-author. Yes, he was a co-author. And, he, and he, did, he didn't really no. sort of understand what we were on about. But that was about, that was about linguistic dif differences in, in the use of language and, that, and, and, and of concept. And, and that yes. still prevents, if you, that, that, those views of not understanding the need to control for these various factors. It's still widespread. It's still widespread. It's still widespread. Um, but I, what I'm, I'm trying to think of, I mean, you know, I, I, having absurd ideas, I'm not sure about. I mean, certainly having inchoate ideas is another matter. Mm. I mean, certainly um, we would have ideas which were not properly formulated to begin with. Mm. Um, and so, in a sense, they might have seemed absurd. Uh, but they, they, it, what I think more likely, they seem kind of, you know, Undeveloped, really, I mean, mm. and, 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 and they need work, and, 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 and that I think that's much more sort of feature of, of of the conceptual problems that one can have in a, in a subject. You really you, you have a sort of glimmering of what what it might be like to do certain sort of things, and then um, as uh, you think more and more about it, it gets it, it gets more and more crystallised mm. and, 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 and clearer. But that would be, I think, more the kind of pattern. Than, than, than the idea that you would come out with something going to be absolutely ridiculous. Yes, I think the only time that we we did what we thought was ridiculous was that brain stimulation experiment. Yes. I, 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 I went, as we were walking along, uh, and and uh, I said this idea this idea comes up for conversation. I I I, I can't be certain about this, but it did it did seem a bit of a way out, you know, a bit way out. Uh, um, uh, but I wouldn't. I don't think would be. It wasn't conceptually absurd. Um, it seemed practically absurd. You know, yes. It, 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 it was that no one actually. People have spoken about it, couldn't do it, and we thought of a way in which we thought we could do it. Um, but I'm trying to think that it's an interesting whether it, whether it's um, Einstein's remark applies more to physicists, does it, mm. uh, and uh, cosmologists. Um, mathematicians than it does uh, to the biologists, um, looking as it were through the telescope the other way around, mm. Mm. thinking in a radically different way. Well, certainly <coughs> our work on the early days of imprinting was radically different yes. from anybody, anybody else's. It was, I think, probably the first way forward after the mm, very depressing years of, uh, of work by Lashley and that group of put in brain lesions as a technique for studying learning and memory and couldn't find any effects uh, in, in uh, mm -hmm. animals, I mean in mammals. <coughs> uh, but I wouldn't say it was absurd, it was, we just, I would have said that what we did was do something that was very, very logical. Gabriel rather implied that, um, in a way, people haven't 
taken any notice of, the, of this work uh, and, and that we haven't made the impact that, 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 that perhaps we should have done. But I, th I think it's worth saying, and, 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 and I, I can say this because he couldn't say it, that um, Gable got the Royal Medal of the Royal Society, which is you know, one of the most distinguished medals of the Royal Society, for this work. And, 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 you know, and all the work that followed on from it, I mean, the, all, all, all the detailed kind of molecular biology that followed from it. But, uh, I mean, so the, it was recognised, actually. I mean, it's, it, and, and, and it's, it was a very, very good that Gable got that. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was, there was, I just wanted to say that, because otherwise it will, it will get left out. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. It, it is slightly puzzling to me that, whereas uh, the work is uh, quite well known in, in Europe, uh, in Japan, in India, it's reasonably well known in China. Um, uh, I think it's referred to, people know about it um, in the States, but there's, but very little research is being done on imprinting and therefore uh, our work on, mem on the memorial aspects of it, the advances we've made and I think that we have many, many firsts. Um, we, well I won't list them, we have many firsts in advancing understanding understanding the way in which that image as it were of the, the, the chick acquires mm. uh, as it learns we have um, a, a very good idea now what actually goes on with the brain and on many on um, it, it, it were memory and in many aspects of that we were the very first our electron microscopy study was the first mm. to show that the junction between neurons is actually changed and specifying what the change was mm. <coughs> That is almost never referred to in the United States of America. I, I've heard you talking about this before, Gabriel. I, I, my immediate hunch was that it was something to do with American culture and history and civilization. I mean, it's often represented as a civilization which is very disinterested in the past. It, it's, it lives in the present, it lives in the future. Therefore, the historical, long historical roots of things, this is observations from Tocqueville onwards, are not followed up. Uh, the past is cut off and you live in the moment. And I therefore wondered whether it was just that they don't want to know about the backlog of ideas that led up to the current experiment and so on. Yeah, well, I think they, have, yes, because they, nick the ideas. they have a very selective memory. Because <laughs> they, they, they remember very well the past, which relates to them. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yes. okay. And then well, they suppress it. Well, it, 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 they forget it. it. Uh, they did pick up the, this, the habituation work from Europe. Yeah. That's a bit of the past they pick up. I can't say they collectively. Mm -hmm. That it was in this instance picked up and taken to the states and 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 was was developed in, mm -hmm. in, in, in this way. So what what that that piece of luggage of the mm -hmm. past was there mm -hmm. was merely the what was in the luggage mm -hmm. was not regarded as being relevant. There was nothing in the luggage. Mm -hmm. Were either of you ever tempted to go to the states? I mean, you must have had many offers for very large increases of salary and so on. I don't know whether you did spend time in the States, but were you ever tempted to do so? And, sure. Yeah. I never was. You know. I mean, I was offered, but I, I never was tempted. Well, well I, I tell you, when I was tempted, um, it was uh, in the um, sort of late 80s, and, and I, I sort of felt I'd been in Cambridge for an awful long time. I mean, I did do a postdoc in the States, and I, did, and I had a number of visiting um, chairs on, uh, in, in, in the States. But I did feel that I quite wanted to, 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 to get out of England at that this point. This before you were provost? Yes, and it actually, I mean, I, I, that was at, at, at that point, I, I, was, I, was, I went to, um, to Berkeley and I, was, and I was really quite tempted about, about the possibility of staying there. Mm. Um, and, and then, then, then um, the, the election came up here and that's when I... Mm. When, when I if, it, if it hadn't happened, you might have gone. I might have gone, yes. Mm. Yeah. But I wouldn't have gone. Um, I had, uh, virtually all my close family, my brothers and my mother, my father having died in this country, they all emigrated to the States. Mm. And therefore, I, when I went to the States, not only did I experience academia and scientists, I also experienced contact with my family. Now, my family was, weren't rich. I mean, they had ordinary jobs, and, and I discovered that one of them wasn't covered for health insurance. Mm -hmm. I uh, realised that some of them didn't have pensions. 
I realized the, the awful face of the United States when people um, are in that state. Now, I wouldn't have been in that financial position that they were in. Um, but um, had I suffered from a long, prolonged illness, I might have lost my insurance. Had I moved with a prolonged illness to another job, and another mm -hmm. insurance scheme, I might have lost all cover for that. If I had had a child born with a congenital deformity, I wouldn't have had cover for that. And I realized that the United States was a wonderful place to go to if you are single, if you are young, married, healthy, uh, don't have children, don't have to f also face them huge, bi huge bills mm -hmm. for education, educating your mm -hmm. children, um, and if you are in good health. Now, knowing the vagaries of life, I knew I couldn't have an expectation of all those things, <laughs> nasty things happening to me and my kind. Mm. So I was absolutely mm. not attracted to this, this hostility. This American dream seems to me to be a dream to relive the inequities of Europe in the 19th century. That, mm. for me, is what is, you know, I'm transmuting the notion of what you mean by the American. When you can convince people who have no insurance cover, that they don't want a health service, national health service, socialised medicine because that's communism, when you can actually convince them that they should go on with a private system that offers nothing for them, the world has gone berserk. So is the American dream for 30% of the people that are like that, with America having the highest infant mortality rate, so far as I know, in the Western world, and one of the, one of the highest in the world, of course, amongst the deprived. Uh, is, is this the American dream, the return to 19th century Europe? Because I know of no other uh, I I vision that can really have in practice. Mm. I must say a lovely joke. Uh, it's, it's not really a joke. It was a discussion between a great um, friend of mine who's a Norwegian surgeon uh, and an, an American surgeon. And the American surgeon had, had uh, uh, just done a sur an operation on a woman. And, and my friend said, uh, uh, what was the operation for? And he said, $10,000. No, no, you didn't understand me. But what did she have? Ten thousand dollars. What about this uh, in relation to your earlier comments about the the college system and the departments and English academic life and non hierarchy being a very good environment for working in? The reason, one of the reasons I've never gone to the states, uh, one of the many is that I don't think it would be as con good a place to work in. Um, I've forgotten who it was, someone like Montesquieu said, England was a place to think in. I mean, France was a place to live in, and Germany was a place to have music in, or whatever it was. England was a place to think in. And I've always felt that this is, I couldn't think of a better intellectual environment than a Cambridge college and Cambridge, and I've never had any temptation to move, really. Um, because talking to people who have been either to think tanks or to universities in America, they, they don't become more productive, and often less so, and they are often under all sorts of strains, difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems, but do you have any experience of what doing science in America would be like as compared? You obviously thought it might be all right, Pat. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that I would, would have gone in the end. I mean, it would have depended on the circumstances, of, of course, enormously. Uh, and uh, I might, might well have turned it down. But uh, I mean, uh, I have a, a lot of rather good experiences of working with, with colleagues in the States mm. um, who uh, are lively, interested in what I'm doing, um, good, good, good colleagues. And, and um, I mean, I, th I think probably you're right that you know, the kind of atmosphere we have here in King's or in Cambridge is. Extraordinary. I mean, it, it, and, 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 and certainly, I, I, I agree with you about productivity. I mean, certainly it was true in the past, but it's as true now when, when we've adopted a lot of American practices. I'm not sure. But it, it certainly was true in the past that the, the, all the innovative ideas in my field were coming out of England. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the very little was coming out of the States. Uh, the the uh, I, I, I thing is, although I sound anti American, and, 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 and I'm not being political, I'm, I'm mm. talking about social structure, mm. and uh, it's that, that social structure is alien mm. for me, and it's uh, mm. because of the dreadful inequities. Not to say we don't have them here, mm. but at least we have, we have a, a system for catching mm. people who are deprived, um, which really doesn't exist in the United mm. States. Um, 
on, on the other hand, I love going, oh, I, I don't go much now because I'm not really interested in going yeah. much now, um, but I used to love going to the States. Um, I, I liked the academics there, I liked the um, discussions I had, but I think never as vigorous as we had them here, but I did like the ambiance there. Um, but those are the reasons, you see, I'm, I'm separating what's, mm -hmm. what's the immediate um, climate. The immediate mm -hmm. climate is, uh, in many instances, a sheer delight. Mm -hmm. But if you say, uh, would you like to live there under all the circumstances mm -hmm. you do, mm -hmm. for example, uh, if we are moving in that direction, I asked a colleague of mine some years ago in Berkeley, um, well, uh, how do you get your research? What, what does the department give you by way of technical assistance? It doesn't give me any technical assistance. You, you see, Alan, you, you're in the humanities. Mm -hmm. We, I particularly need a lot of equipment mm -hmm. um, and need assistance. Um, uh, and, so, and, and some of this is often provided, not all of it, some is provided, some background stuff anyway. Infrastructural mm -hmm. is provided by the department. And that, not a lot, but some. Uh, used to be a lot more. Uh, in the States, there was nothing. And if you didn't, and you were paid for nine months of the year, your stipend was for nine months of the year, I don't know whether it's like that now, but it was, um, and you had to spend the next three months getting money from the research institutes, National Institutes of Health or whatever, um, to give you a stipend for that extra three months, uh, although the stipend for the given by the year is reasonable, mm. perfectly reasonable, but if you could, you could top it up by this extra three months, and you had no technician, so if your grant expired, you had nothing, mm. nothing. Even a phone call was charged. You had to give, you know, give mm. your dial your number, punch your number in, especially if it was across mm. states. Phone call, or oh boy, had to punch in your grant number. This was in the sixties and seventies. Mm. Um, we don't have that here, mm. and let us hope it. Won't. And I would find those irri irritating. On the other hand, if you go to a large research institute, which is funded and they allow you to do your own thing. And they, there are some, that would be great because the equipment there would be superb. Mm. But on the other hand, I don't know. I, for the reasons I've given you, for the intellectual kinds of interactions, um, for the not, well, we look over our shelves a bit now because of the research assessment exercise. But there's so much less of it here, I mm. think, than in the States. I mean, if you look around Europe, actually, the, 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 the German um, <coughs> way of doing things is to take their best scientists and put them into Max Planck. Institutes and, mm. and and some of them work very well, but actually, I mean, I can think of quite a few where an extremely good scientist is put into a research institute, has everything, equipment, mm. research assistance, you know, uh, anything he wants, um, and they go to sleep. I mean, they really do. And, no, uh, uh, and then the, sort of the French system, if you if you become part of the CMRS, you have a job for life, mm. and people become un unproductive after all. I mean, it's, it, 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 there is a kind of stimulus about um, a place where you're in touch with, um, uh, particularly with the young, actually, mm. I mean, who will come and question your assumptions and, you know, actually... And teaching students. It, it's terribly important. Mm. I think that that is crucial, actually, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, the exposure to young minds, and especially the young minds that come to Cambridge, mm. and they're very bright young people, and they do challenge, I've been challenged by them in the most marvellous way, yes. when teaching, yes. teaching first year undergraduate, mm. kids mm. coming up from school. Mm. Mm. And, you, and they say, well, what research do you do? And you say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about this and that and the other. And, you go, and then they ask you a question. And they obviously look uncomfortable because they think it's a silly question. And you know that it's a really first class question. And you know as well, oh, I know. I didn't I miss that one. <laughs> I, I miss that one. Yeah. And I think that the, re of course, you go and work in a research institute, you've got all the equipment, you've got, you don't have to apply for grant, grant no grants beyond applications to be failed or successful mm. or cut or whatever. But you're deprived of this source of intellectual stimulation. Uh, one can trivialise it and one can justify it by saying, mm. well, I'm, I'm self-justifying it because this mm. is the situation I'm in. I'm in it because I chose to be in it. Mm. And I find when I can contrast working in a laboratory at, uh, at CNRS yes. in Paris, no students out at that laboratory, mm. Chief Sir Yvette, mm. um, and for me, the place was just sort of hollow in a way. Um, the interactions were rather inconsequential. The people would be coming in extremely late, not being sure what they want to do for the rest of the day anyway. No stimulus to do very much yet, and no, and no challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, this can't be true all over, and I'm not no, saying it's 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 But there, there is this risk, whereas 
in this this atmosphere, in especially in the collegiate system, this is why I can't understand why it's not been exported elsewhere, except I've been told by vice chancellor elsewhere it's too expensive. Mm. Um, where you meet people from other disciplines mm. as well, and, mm. and it's those other disciplines, you were in a sense another discipline, behavioural sciences. Yeah. I was in anatomy. Yeah. How would I have come across a behavioural science? No, that's right. Um, and the same is true for John Griffith, a mathematician. Mm. How would I have come across a mathematician if I hadn't been in some melting pot mm. of intellectual discourse, which a college is? Mm. So you get this opportunity to, and everyone gets so bored with students sometimes, after you've done it for many, many mm. years, it becomes difficult. But there is a real benefit. Mm. Um, and the option to meet, meet with you and Pat and many, many other people here in the college is, is fantastic. There is a trade-off, of course, I mean, because I mean, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I see colleagues who go into, um, into a university where there's masses of teaching mm. and having too much student contact mm. and they suffer mm. and, and, they get, and, and they don't produce anything ever again, I mean, they, they disappear. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it, there's not the right. Yes, too much really bright, but not too many students. Mm. Yes, I, mean, I, me I remember but Berkeley, I don't know what your experience at Berkeley, but my experience at Berkeley where it was that the uh, I, I taught a pretty heavy load for the period I was there, um, but the, the uh, assistant, associate, the full professors, they had huge teaching loads yeah. and, and um, laboratory mm. classes, you know, practical classes, we mm. call, they call lab labs. Mm. And, Although some of the labs were run by their PhD students, nevertheless they were in, responsible for them. And the, the contact time that they spent with students, not with small groups, but in lecturing mm. seminars, postgraduate seminars, or teaching in the postgraduates mm. of the postgraduates, it was a big thing as well as undergraduate mm. teaching, that occupied a huge amount of their time. And mm. I thought, oh, how do they get it? I asked one of them, how do you get any time to do research yourself? And was told, this was a man was actually publishing a lot of good stuff. He was in his late thirties. He said, I don't ever go in the lab. I tell my research students what to do and they bring the results. And I said to him, well, what happens if a new technique comes along and you've got to learn it, what do you do? I said, oh, well, I don't know. not a clear answer to it. Uh, and, and, and so I think there, too, they get isolated. It's something we, we often forget when we offer these nice jobs in the States. Mm that there often is a huge teaching load. Yeah, sure. As I say, I'm not sure I would have gone if I, <laughs> if I had, uh, uh, had stepped inside to say, yeah. yeah. What about going further east? I mean, now the centre of gravity of the world is moving to the far east. Um, I know that Gabriel's been on a mission to China. Uh, you probably have as well, Pat. But uh, what is your, and you mentioned occasionally that your work was taken up by the Japanese uh, as well as others. I mean, what, what is your assessment, say, of the Japanese and the Chinese research efforts? And or Singapore, else? actually. Sorry? Sing Singapore is incredible. So, or Singapore. I mean, the, the, um, an enormous amount of work is going to move there. I mm. mean, the, the, the drug companies are going there because they, they, they're, they're so um, har harassed by, by animal rights extremists mm. in, in, mm. in this country. Mm. And, and the Singapore government pours an enormous amount. Pours, pours money into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's brought all sorts of people. It took Sidney Brenner there, I mean, you know, it takes all mm. sorts of people. Mm. I mean, mm. really distinguished people. Mm. And, yeah. and they have very good well. students. I mean, uh, uh, they have a very good educational system. So, I mean, I, I have no experience of doing Japan. Mm. Um, I, I, I have, nor, nor, in, nor in China, but um, I, I was very impressed by Taiwan, for example, where they had an extremely good um, schooling system very well trained. Mm. Um, and so, you know, a lot of things which we're losing actually is just sort of sheer incompetence. I mean, mm. they've really taken a lot of trouble with it. So, I mean, they, they are good academic environments, no question mm. about that. Well, you, you know, of course, that uh, our own colleague in this college and our colleague in the Department of Zoology, Mike Bate, yes. a very distinguished uh, developmental biologist, he spends a great deal of his time at Bangalore and yeah, he exactly. loves it. Yeah. Mm. First class, they've got a, a research institute in Bangalore, which is headed by a king, and, uh, yeah. the Rao. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, um, yes. Anyway, he's, he's a kingsman. He was a fellow of King. Mm. He was brought over here, well, he came over here, for, and we had him uh, elected as a, as a visiting fellow for a year, I think. Um, and then he went back, uh, and he'd become head of this huge research institute, 
Uh, he's very autocratic. I don't know if you've ever seen him in, in no, I yeah. uh, I mean, you've got this, this, this kind of charm, you know, who's sort of, when he's with you, he's sort of very, very kind of warm and nice. You can see him in his own institute. Bossy <laughs> 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 yeah, people around like crazy. Well, that so, wouldn't be appealing. So the <laughs> bait must, must find it. No, well, he, has very, he, has, he has some very good colleagues. There's some very nice people in that. No, are you beginning to get, I'm getting a lot of Chinese students, PhD students and others, and they're flocking over and they're very good. You be, uh, is the Chinese influence beginning to build up in your well, discipline? I, I, I actually uh, uh, employed as a postdoc, uh, um, a, a Chinese postdoc. Uh, he actually had left China, took a degree, a medical degree in China, and did some neurophysiological work in China. Then he went off to a PhD in, uh, in Brazil. And then he came to work with us, and now he's into the States. Mm -hmm. And there is a thing now as a signification of, of science. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, Chinese are, especially in the States, and the fact that um, the um, post-11, the 9th of September, um, has reduced the intake of uh, people from the Far East into the States, mm -hmm. has had a, a near catastrophic effect on science in the States. And I remember attending a meeting here in Cambridge about three years ago when the president of the American Academy of Sciences uh, uh, said, I, I do not like talking about my country when I'm abroad uh, in any adverse way, but there is a very serious problem that faces its science with the mm -hmm. present restrictions on influx of foreign graduates and foreign postdocs. Um, I don't know whether they're uh, liberalizing mm -hmm. access, I don't know that, but it, Yes, a, a, um, a colleague here who is professor of Chinese, I think, said to talk to me about the simplification of science. Mm. And then I thought, well, yes, there are a lot of people in my field and molecular biology where there's either a lead scientist mm. who is Chinese or not. The, I'm told that I don't know much about science in, in China myself, but um, I, I do know that Tom Blundell thinks very, very highly indeed of their biotechnology. No, sure. Uh, and they are moving on at a tremendous speed. So, yes, we, there's no question that... They've got a very big computer centre, the biggest overseas computer centre there. And they're, they're, all, they're turning less and less, actually, to, to, to the West now. Mm. They, they, they feel sufficiently confident about what they're doing. They, they don't even, you know... Mm. A, lot, a lot of people do come, but, mm. but, but, but a lot of people stay. Mm. And they're very good. I mean, and many of them are going back, too, uh, from the States. Yeah. Yeah, That's a deliberate policy, by the way. That is a deliberate policy because I had the uh, pleasure um, about five years ago uh, of come, uh, the vice chancellor had, was receiving a group of Chinese scientists and he had there the Minister for Education. Mm. Um, and I asked him about investment. And he said, like 50%, 15, one five percent of gross domestic product is going into higher education. I don't know whether that's actually correct, and I may have got the figure wrong, but it was an astonishing high figure. And they are pouring money into scientific institutions with the clear intention, he said, not only of educating those who don't go abroad and make, you know, making absolute first-class science uh, um, uh, facilities, but also drawing back those who have gone abroad. Mm. And they're clearly being successful. Do you remember we had uh, a, a Chinese research fellow here who during the Cultural Revolution, mm. had on a pig farm, had taught himself English, mm. higher maths, uh, advanced physics. I mean, in his spare time, mm. with such spare time as he had, <laughs> and he finally he got to Australia, and 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 and, and then he came here, and, and mm. incredibly nice and very very bright man, and and I mean, although he had all these ghastly experiences, mm. <coughs> you know, as a young man, he wanted, he wanted, he went back mm. to, to to China mm. after you know mm. after all his experiences. So I mean, very, very patriotic. Mm. Mm. Mm.